communication allows us to accelerate our dreams much faster. So think of it like this. Three questions. What do you want out of life? It could be anything in business. The second question is who has already achieved what you want in business? But then there's a third question that a lot of executives don't think about, frankly, Jason, which is the person that already has what you want. How are they coming off? How are they communicating? And what's the delta between that person who has what you want and where you stand today? And that's the delta you need to work on. The Spear and Clover Podcast, the show where military mindset meets the spirit of the puppy. I'm your host, Jason Skisik, the entrepreneurial evangelist, and each week I bring you the stories of visionaries who see the world as it could be and can't help but to take action. If you're enjoying these episodes, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and review. This is the best way to stay in the loop when we drop new content. Don't forget, the conversation continues in our brand new Spear and Clover community group. Check us out on Discord or follow the link in our bio to join this free group for entrepreneurs or one entrepreneurs. Hey, entrepreneurs, does any of this sound familiar? Have you hired only A players? Purchased the latest fire plays from so-called gurus? Consistently almost become an elite organization only to have it result in talented employees regressing to mediocrity, tactical plays spiking performance and then fading away quickly, managers losing discipline and hunger, and then either leaving or just coasting. Do you really think the difference between you and the industry leading team is a hire or a slick new marketing play? That's the same tired crap that my Chicago Bears have shoved down my throat for over 30 years. Meanwhile, the Green Bay Packers have had two coaches in 50 years, they've had two quarterbacks in 20 years, and they're a contender every single year. Many leaders buy the best playbooks, they draft the best talent, and they hire the best coaches, and year after year they return without trophies. Who could blame them? Most business coaches, consultants, and so-called gurus only sell tactical playbooks designed to provide a brief spike followed by a return to business as usual. The truth is, winning is simple. You need a clear North Star supported by managers and role players that have absolutely zero uncertainty about how they can help the team win today. Our simple program helps you become a dynasty organization from top to bottom. Dynasty Defined not only helps you structure a team that's capable of consistently winning championships, but once you do, they'll be writing their own playbooks, recruiting the best talent, and calling their own plays from the field. The choice is yours. Continue to hope that the next hire or fire marketing play will finally solve all your problems or commit to winning permanently, roll up your sleeves, and let's get started defining your dynasty. Guys, I am beyond pumped to announce that we are now accepting applications for Dynasty Defined. Cohorts are limited to eight entrepreneurs and they fill up quickly, so head over to spearandclover.com now and claim your spot. I can't wait to see you on the inside. As long as I can remember, I've loved watching athletes. This is not uncommon. As I've gotten older though, my admiration has shifted from the sport itself to the type of person who devotes themselves wholly to becoming a true professional both on and off the field. This has opened my eyes to a whole new scope of professional athlete. Our guest today is an all-star in the sport of speaking and communicating. Here's what I mean by that. In any given conversation, debate, pitch, or public speech, there's a game happening. The folks who are able to consistently win this game are the ones who share the most with the traditional athletes I spoke of earlier. They practice, they challenge themselves to step out of their comfort zone, and they seek to be on the field with other greats of their era. Brendan Kamarasamy does all of the above and more. He's the owner of Master Talks, a company dedicated to helping others play the communication game at the highest level. His YouTube channel of, of the same name is the best place that I have ever seen to do so absolutely free. And to top it all off, He's one of the most prolific podcast guests I've ever met or seen, and even offers an unbelievable free workshop every single month. During this conversation, Brendan and I become fast friends and have since stayed in contact multiple times. You will soon see why. Please welcome my friend, Brendan Kamarasamy. Brendan, how are you, man? Great, Jason. How are you, brother? Dude, I'm so excited for this. A lot of times I meet... I've Everybody that's been on the show, I've enjoyed. I've I've stayed in touch with most of the folks that stay, come on the show. But man, the first time we talked, I, we really hit it off. I've thought of you a couple of times. I even think I've tried to, to send a couple of folks your way because I'm really impressed by what it is that you do. And I can't wait for you to share that with our audience today. So for the record, what is it that you do, Brendan? 
Very kind of you, man. The, the feeling is definitely mutual. I had a lot of fun. I was very looking forward to this one. So yeah, absolutely. So the story started when I was in college, university, Jason. I did these things called case competitions at business school. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So you're like the real professional sports guy. You're like going to the jujitsu camps. You're doing all this stuff. <laughs> so, so you're like the typical normal person. Whereas me, I did like presentations competitively. That was my thing when cool. I was in college. And that's how I learned how to speak. And then as I got older, I started coaching other people how to communicate ideas. Not because I was some expert. It's because all these students needed a coach to do really well at these competitions. So I wasn't charging them or anything. I was just coaching them out of love. And that's what led to Master Talk. So I started a YouTube channel and I called it that because I felt that all the information that was in my mind wasn't really available for free on the internet. And that's how I started making videos and it accidentally turned to a successful coaching business. So here we are today. That's amazing. And so, first of all, I love that it's a YouTube channel. I think all too often, you know, experts or coaches or gurus, which is the word I hate, you know, they put everything behind a paywall. I love that you decided to make it your free shit is better than their paid shit is, is an Alex Hormozy line that I always love. So tell me a little bit about why you chose to, to put it out there for everybody. Absolutely, Jason. You're absolutely right. I agree. I think for me, it was because I never intended it to be a business. Mm. But let me be very specific what I mean here. I'm not trying to portray myself as some philanthropist or some saint here from a church. The reason it was never intended to be a business was specifically because I was already making money. Mm. Because I was a technology consultant at IBM. That was the dream. That's why I did all of those case competitions to get that job. So for me, Master Talk was just a hobby. So I just said, huh, I should probably share this stuff for free because I, I didn't even know you get paid to be a coach, brother. Like that's mm -hmm. how lost I was. Yeah. I was just making videos. It was only a few months after I started the YouTube channel, probably nine months into it, that I went to Columbus, Ohio for Summit of Greatness, Lewis House's event. He's also yeah. a podcaster. Love and his I met, podcast. Yeah, he's great. So he's he was a big hero of mine. I started listening to his show when I was like, what, 20 years old or something. And I went to his conference and I met my business partner there. And he is the one who said, you know, you could charge executive thousands of dollars for this, right? And I said, huh, really? And that's when I started really building the, the foundation, which later became the real master talk, which is today. That's fantastic, man. And so so tell me about these competitions. When you're doing them, what is it that you were doing? Like, I'm just interested in what that is. I haven't heard of that before. And that's normal, by the way. It's a very niche community. Yeah, yeah. So you know how in sports, right? Like say you want to be drafted into the NBA or the MLB or the NFL or something. We all know how this works. Talent scouts go to Division I universities primarily. They see how you play, and then they scout you for the professional leagues. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. Case competitions is the same game, just a lot less competitive, obviously, mm -hmm. for a business school to give the best business jobs. So think Goldman Sachs on Wall Street. Think investment banking, consulting jobs at McKinsey, Deloitte, IBM, all the big dogs, Amazon, insert any big company there. They use case competitions as a recruitment tool for the best students to pick them up before anyone else does. Example, let's say Walmart was a case sponsor, I believe seven years ago, if my memory is correct. And the senior vice president of the company themselves comes out to the competition and they give 20 year old kids a 20 page document. Example, let's say me and you're on the same team. They go, okay, Brendan, Jason, I'm thinking about opening a new location and I'm debating between these three cities. Which one should I pick and why? Mm. So what these students do for three hours, Jason, is we read the 20 page document, we create slides, make a financial statement, make a solution and implement strategy. And at the end of the three hours, we have to actually present it directly to the board directly. So there's no presentation. There's no practice. So the goal here is not to be like perfect, but to be so good that the executive looks at you and goes, shit, okay, you're present better than my VP. So let's give you a job. <laughs> That's so cool. I would have loved that. When I was in credit training in uh, at JP Morgan, we had to do stuff like that. They'd be like, this is the company. This is what they do. Here's their situation. Here's their ratios and all that. And then like the next day, we'd have to come in and like basically present whether or not like the loan package was going to get approved or not, or how we got our arms around it and things like that. So that's a super fun thing to do. Okay. So somebody's listening to this at home. They didn't go to business school. Maybe they do have a business. Maybe they're thinking about having a business. Number one, why is it important for them to learn how to be a good public speaker? For sure, Jason. You know, the way I think about it from the context of business, and then we could also go for the context of life as well, is communication is an accelerant of dreams. Example, if you want to build a business, you could do it without communication. 
it'll just be harder because you won't get on the stages. You won't get on the podcast. You won't be able to amplify your message. Mm. That's why people like Gary Vaynerchuk, who I believe is a media guy first, business guy second, though he would probably disagree with me, is because he's so good at media, he's got so many eyeballs on him that he doesn't need to look for customers. He wins a lot of Fortune 500 clients without an RFP. Yeah, he doesn't Grant have to same way. Yeah. Yeah. Grant's the same way. And a lot of people in real estate argue that Grant's fund isn't even the best fund in the market. But the point is, he's, he's the most known guy in the industry. He can get funded whenever he wants. Yeah. Exactly. In the same way Ryan Surhant is for million dollar listing in, on the agent side. So the key is, is that communication allows us to accelerate our dreams much faster. So think of it like this. Three questions. What do you want out of life? It could be anything in business. The second question is, who has already achieved what you want in business. But then there's a third question that a lot of executives don't think about, frankly, Jason, which is the person that already has what you want. How are they coming off? How are they communicating? And what's the delta between that person who has what you want and where you stand today? And that's the delta you need to work on. Wow. That's fascinating. And so from that, so that's why they would want to be, what are some things that somebody can do right now that would maybe help them to become a better public speaker? Absolutely. So four things. One is a mindset piece, and then it's my easy three. So let's do the mindset piece, pause, and then jump into the tactics. So what's the most important thing? This question. How would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? Why do I start with that question? The reason is simple, Jason. We dream about anything we want in our life. Our business goals, finance goals, health goals, relationship goals. Do we have communication goals? Most of us don't. And that's the problem, is if we're not dreaming about our communication skills in the same way, by the way, that we dream about the expensive yachts we want to buy, the cars we want to get, the success we want to have, we won't actually move towards it in a way that generates excitement. And that's what this question solves for, is the idea that communication right now is seen like a chore. Like doing the dishes. Oh, like I have to get better. And if you come into that skill with that energy, you will definitely lose. Agreed. And then the three easy? Yeah, the three easy. So the three easy is let's start the concept first. I think communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time, Jason. One of those balls is storytelling, body language, posture, eye contact. If you try and do all 18 at the same time, Jason, all those balls are going to fall to the floor. So my perspective has always been, what are the three easiest balls to juggle? That's my easy threes. So let's start with number one, which is the random word exercise. Pick a random word like pen, trophy case, master, talk, tissue box, and create random presentations out of thin air. Why does this matter? Helps you think on your feet and... If you could make sense out of nonsense, you could make sense out of anything. And that's why I encourage people to do this every day. That's really interesting. You got to tell us though, because I'm sure not, and I'm not the only one wondering, is there a pen, a, a tissue box and a trophy case in front of you right now? There are. Absolutely. What's in the trophy case? So it's not a trophy case. It's a trophy that my friend's girlfriend made for me. She's super sweet. Because I helped them with their packages. So she sent me like a, a trophy of Master Talk hitting 25,000 subscribers. Oh man, on YouTube. that's amazing. Congratulations. So, I'm so glad I asked you. that follow up. All right, tell me the other two easy. I love you, how perceptive you are. So, so the, the second one is question drills. We get asked questions all the time in our life, Jason. On a call like this, when we're talking to prospects on a podcast, TV show, if we go on shows, school, work, you name it. But most of us are reactive to those questions. We're not proactive. Example, Mm. when I started guesting on shows, I sucked. So obviously I'm a lot sharper these days, but back then it was, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. So somebody asked me the funniest question. He said, hey, uh, Brendan, where does the fear of communication come from? I was like, London, San Diego. (laughs) It's like, I don't know, man. So it wasn't working for me. I was reactive. So how did I fix that? And you can see the night and day difference. Now I'm like, okay, this question comes, I know I'd answer it right away. Definitely. Yeah. It's all the question drill. Every day for five minutes, Jason, that's all I ask. Answer and reflect on one question you think the world will ask you. Whether it's from your prospect, oh, your thing's too expensive. Or whether it's from a podcast host, hey, tell me your story. If you do that for five minutes every day for a year, you'll have answered 365 questions about your business, your products, your services, and your expertise. You'll be unstoppable. You'll be bulletproof. That's a clip right there, buddy. That was great. I love this. <laughs> What's the third one? Absolutely. So the third one is so simple. Nobody does it, brother. Make a list of all your existing clients, especially for my business owners. This is actually how I make most of my money and why 50% of my pie is word of mouth. This is all I do. Make a list of all my clients, active, not active. 
when it's their birthday, when there's a holiday, open my bloody phone and I send them a 20 second video message. That's it. Nothing crazy. I don't have to put a suit on for it. It's little like, hey, happy birthday. Hope you're having a wonderful day. No pitch, nothing. And you know what happens? 10% of the time, always, 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 let's say I'm sending like 100 videos per quarter at the very minimum. 10 of those videos, they message me back and go, oh, Brendan, that's so nice of you. I love your video messages. And by the way, I was just thinking about you. One of my vice president friends that I went to golf with last week, I totally forgot to make an introduction for you. Boom, intro made, I just made money. That's it, mm. but nobody does it. Why? Because they're worried about how they look. They worried about what people think, but here's the main message. People want to hear from you, the people who already bought into you. Why? Because you don't need to be famous to the world, Jason. You just need to be famous to your clients. And that's more than enough. I love that. I was listening to uh, Jeff Gittimer. He's a bit older now, but he was he was a big writer. Actually, his wife, Jen Gittimer, is on the show this week. She's out this week. And he was talking about a lot of people want to try to make their clients satisfied. And he's like, just one degree below satisfied is unsatisfied, but loyal is much more valuable. There is no, like, people don't just become unloyal. That's not like one degree away. So he's like, if you're, if you're focusing on making your clients satisfied, you're always in this tenuous position where you could fall off that cliff at any moment, right? But if you just make them loyal, then something bad happens and they're like, hey, man, what's, what's the deal? And you go, I'll fix it and we'll work on it. And you know, as long as you're working in earnest, I think it's okay. I love that that networking piece because I'm somebody who also really appreciates reaching out to people and connecting people. I like making business babies, I always say. So like when I meet somebody who's like looking to develop software and I know somebody that makes software that would be similar, I immediately connect those people and, and push myself out of the situation. In fact, I usually turn down affiliate deals because I want to be a gunslinger with it. I want to be like super aggressive of like, look, I have no money to make, but that guy's the shit. You got to go talk to him. He's amazing or she's awesome or whatever. I want to shout you out. We're both on a, a soft a service that is called it's called Podmatch and it's like a dating site for podcasting. It's it's how I find some guests, it's how I get on to other shows, it's how you get on to shows. There are 25 or 26,000 members on that thing and they're all ranked by their responsiveness, the reviews that they get, the reviews that they give, oh, that they're actually following protocol. Do you know who's number 1 <laughs> on the whole platform? Is it Jennifer Lopez? I think it's Brendan Kamarasamy. I think it's you, dude. Tell me about that. Like that speaks volumes to me. I'm number 30, by the way. I was 20, but I took a week off. So I'm coming for your ass. But how do you make that happen? And what is it about your behavior that led to that? Because you're a terrific podcast guest, but that's not going to make you number one. What is it about your behavior that, that ranked you like that? Wow, Jason, that is a question I've definitely never been asked. So thanks for that. All right. So here, here's what I would say. First, you're awesome. Really appreciate you. And the other piece is Kevin Durant's quote, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. The reason I'm number one on Podmatch, and I will add, because you asked me the question, why I'll stay number one is I'm willing to go on anybody's podcast. I've been on some of the biggest shows in the world, and I've been on shows with one listener. And you know what? I don't care. That's how, me, about, right? That's how we got them. That's how we got them. For me, it's always about the human being. There's going to be a point in my life where I just can't do this anymore. Like just yesterday, I think I was on like seven interviews in a day because that's how badly I want it. I want Master Rock to be successful and it's already successful, but I mean more successful because it's important to share those ideas with the world. And I love podcasts. I love meeting new people. That's a side note. But I think the biggest thing is I told myself when I started this journey, I said, I don't even care if I have to go on 10,000 podcasts. Because you know what the worst thing will happen? The worst thing will happen is me and Jason will have a conversation and he's the only person listening to me right now, let's assume, which I hope, I don't think is the case in your, in your situation. Yeah. But let's just assume that for, for play's sake. 10,000 people, at least... I would have 10,000 new friends and 10,000 new subscribers to my YouTube channel. Yeah. I knew if at least that, I would have that. And it just so happened I didn't need to do 10,000, fortunately for me. Is it possible for you to behave this way if you didn't earnestly want to make those friendships? I think it's possible to not do it earnestly up towards a certain amount of reps. So maybe like 100, 200, you could probably get away with it. 10,000 though, I think it's tough. I agree. I think I it's agree. tough. When I was little, my mom would always get mad at me, whether it, it would be different types of people. But I remember vividly, like we would go to like retirement community with the church and like be volunteering. And I would be asking them like detailed questions about like whatever knitting or their walker or like something that a kid should have no interest in. And my mom thought I was being patronizing and like sarcastic. And she'd be like, knock it off. 
And I'd be like, what? I'm, I'm actually interested. I'm like, I'm interested in you, like whatever you are. Like when I meet somebody who, you know, does cosplay as a cat, like, man, I got questions. Let's go. And it, it may seem like I'm like poking or prodding, but I really want to be friends with those people. Like every guest that I've had on this show. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> like, I would love to like have a beer with that person and like, and stay connected with them. And I do. There's a bunch of you that are listening to this right now, or they'll see a clip or whatever online that get texts from me pretty regularly. And I feel like, I feel like guys like us are pretty rare. What do you attribute that to? What's your personality like, like off business? Like, what do you, what do you like as a person? Honestly, I think that's why I do so many podcasts because I'm all business. Like, that's why I love it so much, right? Yeah. Super fun from, obviously I have my weird hobbies too. You know, I karaoke in eight different languages. I go to a club with my family every quarter or two. Right. So, so there's cool. a, right. And, and I love going to Kumbaya conferences. Like that's where I'm leaving for tomorrow. I'm going to like three conferences in a row that I'm super excited about. But I think that the key is what gets you out of bed. And and what I would say for the personality side, why, why I guess I'm overly nice in the same way you are, is I think it's because of how I was grown up. You know, my mom is probably one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. And I'll tell you the story. When I was 10 years old, I was standing in front of a bus stop and I find $10 on the floor. So I get really excited because for me, $10 was like 10000 you know, my parents were factory workers. We didn't grow up with a lot. So I took the 10 bucks and I was like, shit, how much candy can I buy with this? So I put it in my pocket. And at the end of school, I tell my mom, mom, guess what? I found $10 on the floor. The first thing she asked me straight out of her mouth, as soon as I said that, are you sure that's not somebody else's $10? And I go, well, I'm sure it is, but there's nobody there. So, so I'll take it. And then she told me a story that changed my life. She said, you know, Brendan, when I immigrated to this country, uh, she's a very short woman. So she always looks on the floor. I hated the snow and I'm walking and I found a $20 bill. And then she looked at me and said, super casually. And then I used that $20 bill to feed a family who couldn't eat that day. But she said it in a way that wasn't a lesson. It's like, hey, I did the dishes and then I fed some family. So ever since she had told me that story, I always just behaved differently mm. and said, like, what can I do to serve other people? I'm still a selfish guy, but it's a mix between how can I be selfish, but also be selfish in a way that adds value to people around me. And that's the other piece that I've always appreciated about people like Gary Vaynerchuk is like, it doesn't matter how successful you are. What matters the most is your character and how you treat other people, because that's, that's the one thing you can never change. You can change your businesses, you can change your revenue models, but you can't change your name. Wow. I, I think that's so interesting. And again, we have some alignment here. I always think about, I think there's a book in here somewhere of like the currencies of life of like, there are so many different currencies. And so as somebody who has made a very, we'll just leave it at bold decision, both of us, right? To, to broadcast ourselves out, like people should listen to us, right? I've, I've been a coach. I've sold info products. I've coached people. I know you have as well. I'll go in a float tank and I'll think about what it means to influence people and why I choose to do it. And there's like a million reasons why somebody would do those things. And I'm going to ask you yours in a moment, but it's like, am I doing it? to gain honor and prestige and the admiration of my peers and others? Am I doing it to make money? Am I doing it to get over on people and, you know, trick people? Am I doing it to just genuinely be earnestly altruistic and only provide help to others? Is, is that feeling the currency? Like, what is it that you put in your bank from leading with, with, with service? Absolutely, Jason. I would say it's a mix of all the minus maybe the tricking and the yeah, manipulation. I threw some nasty ones in <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, 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 either yeah. one. So maybe minus that. But I would say everything else I think can be is equally applicable. So when I started Master Talk, it was more just to help people. But it's a mix, right? Because I don't want to. I don't. I don't like giving off the impression that I'm some altruist either. I think it's a mix between. And I'll tell you the story. When I ended case competitions, when my university career was ending. It's kind of like when a professional athlete retires from the NBA. So one day, 10,000 people are screaming your name. The next day, nobody knows who you are and they don't care either. I was having a similar crisis, but not with 10,000 people. Okay, It was probably like 10 people or 100 people. But it was more just this but idea. They had, the, they had the resources of 10,000 people. <laughs> Go ahead. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Okay, fair enough. But, but the key is, it's like I was leaving my university career. I'd gotten the dream job I wanted and I felt an emptiness. And I said, hmm, okay, so I'm going to be at IBM. And I found out really quickly at the job that I was going to be really successful. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, it's like, because I'd done so many case competitions that there wasn't going to be this moment where I'm saying, yeah, IBM is going to keep challenging. By the way, it's a great company. They're my client. They're great. Like, it's not like a bad job or anything. It was just, it wasn't enough to satisfy my thirst for life that I had from case competition. 
So in many ways, Master Talk began as an outlet selfishly to give myself meaning where if I shared this information with other people, it would help people, but also create significance in my own life, which is still the case to this day. But since then, the thesis has evolved, which is the following that I'll tell you it's a story. And it's a TikTok that I watched a few months ago. Okay. So the TikTok is about Taylor Swift, Jason. So Taylor Swift's on the stage. She wins Woman of the Year and it's 2014. It's like this award that Billboard gives out every year, the music company. So she looks at the stage and she goes, your future Woman of the Year is 11 years old right now. She's sitting in a choir. She's learning how to sing. She's afraid. And we need to take care of her. And then the TikTok flips. And it's five to seven years later. And Billie Eilish becomes the youngest inductee in Billboard's history to win Women of the Year. She's like 17 or something. So she gets up on that stage. She's got her big bulky jacket, big glasses. She looks at the crowd and she says something along the lines of, yo, like, what's up, everyone? I don't know how I won. Like, I'm barely a woman, but shout out to Taylor Swift. And she's like rambling. And then the last 30 seconds completely changes my and really showed me what Master Talk is for and what it is about. The last 30 seconds of her speech sounded something like this. Oh, yeah. And it was like 2014. I was watching Taylor Swift's speech and I was 11 years old. And I was in choir and I was learning how to sing. So thank you for taking care of me, Billboard. And then she walks off the stage. And the reason that always gives me goosebumps, Jason, is I thought about this, right? I I I thought about the next Elon Musk, bro. Because when Elon was 13 years old, nobody gave a shit about him. Nobody. He was some kid in South Africa, you know, being abused by his dad, dysfunctional family, you know, was reading his Isaac Asimov science fiction books. And nobody sat him down for 45 minutes and say, hey, kid, you're going to be a superstar one day. Let's let's work on your fill of words. He still became that successful guy that he became. But would his life would have been easier if he was a great communicator? Absolutely, undeniably. But the bigger question became, what about the next Elon Musk? Because we don't know who that person is right now, who's 13, 14, 15 years old. It might be a girl in Cambodia. Who knows? But what I do know for a fact is I'm the only person in the world who's thinking about that girl right now who can't afford me, who will never see me, and creating resources for that person. So what's my mission now? My mission is, how do I empower every genius that's ever going to live for the rest of time to be an exceptional communicator? Because if I become that poster child, they'll all grow up being exceptional, and the human race as a whole will advance at lightning speed. Beautiful, man. Reminds me of Khan Academy for uh, for speaking. Are you familiar with Khan Academy? I'm sure you are, right? Yeah, of course. That got me through business school. Okay, cool. Um, So- First of all, that did give me chills. I love that. Let me back that up a little bit. I think that the probably the number one thing that you can do to make money, to, to have financial success is sales, right? Like being able to sell. Doesn't matter if you want to be a CEO, if you want to go fund a big startup, if you want to get on the board of a company, you're selling in one way or another. And ultimately that boils down to communication. And so I guess you answered the question as to why you have chosen to give that to other people, right? And I don't know if there's really a question here. I just think, I think it's so interesting that you, that, so I guess what I'm saying is you have the keys to a very powerful sports car. You're a very good communicator. You're clearly very, very intelligent. You clearly take the steps. That's why you're number one, right? On this podcasting site, you clearly take the steps to, to be disciplined and to do the things that you should do. And so untold, financial resources could be available to you. And you've chosen to give back. And I know you are a for-profit company, obviously, and we'll talk a little more about that. I guess, thank you. I don't think there's a question. Just thanks, man. Like, that's cool of you. I, I appreciate about a brother, man. But but I think the key is like, that. that's why I keep reemphasizing, because I want to make sure people get the right angle from me, is that I'm not perfect in the sense of, I'm not trying to be Mother Teresa. It's because my brain is wired that way. You know, other people, they get enjoyment out of life from doing different things. There's this great documentary. I'm really trying to put my finger on it. It's basically about this guy. I'm sure sure you'll you'll know about this guy who tries to free solo this this mountain. For those of you who are listening to this, free soloing just means when you try and climb a mountain without any rope. So if you make a mistake, you just die. Right. So I forget what the Honald. Thank you so much. Yeah, Honald. Exactly. So there's a scene in the in the documentary that Alex talks about where he compares him and his girlfriend. And I'll remember that scene for the rest of my life. He said that me and my girlfriend, I'm quoting him now, just get happiness from different areas. My girlfriend wants to be safe. She wants to have a family. She wants to buy gifts on Christmas. And for me, I was scared shitless about climbing that wall for the last 10 years until I asked myself, well, what if I got across the other side? What lies on the other side of that? 
what legacy and anyone who's average or normal like in a good way as a compliment to them not a not an insult who listens to that thinks alex is completely insane like it's just like what is this guy talking? What do you mean to the other side? What if you don't make it to the other side? You'll probably die. And it's that willingness where he gets happiness from just doing cool shit. Like Elon Musk, like Jeff Bezos, like Richard Branson, just people. Sarah Blakely, I would argue too. Just people who just get excitement from just doing cool shit. It's the same thing with me. That's what master talk is. Yes, do I want to change the world? Yes, do I want to be the Dale, next Dale Carnegie? Absolutely. And create financial success and wealth. And, and I and thank, knock on what I've done that to a certain extent. But more so, yes, and it's about doing cool shit. Like being the communication coach, the best in the world and sharing all this shit forever. That's something nobody has done with their life. And I think that's really cool. And I'm 26 too, which is like even more nuts. Okay. So that's a great point. I want to anchor that moment because you're 26 years old and you're at least speaking in terms that come off as wisdom. So what is wisdom? And beyond just speaking well, how do you learn the skill? Like you've pulled stories. I know you're a podcast guest on a bunch of shows. So I understand this is practice to some extent, like you're a comic, right? You're like doing material a little bit. I get that. We're going to open the box a little here. But sure. so like, how do you, how do you acquire wisdom faster than a normal human being? Because you're clear, you're, you're at least giving the, I don't know you well enough, but you're at least giving the impression of a very wise person right now. How do you attribute, what do you attribute that to? Absolutely, man. So, so I love that you pointed all these points. So you're right. It, it is a comic point at some key. If you answer the same question over and over again, you're, you're going to get the same. You're looking in somebody's yes. eyes, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. But what you're doing an exceptional job at is you're asking brand new questions. And I can't, I can't go on script. I have to go off script, which is good. So here's the way I think about it, brother. How do we accumulate the wisdom of someone who's already dead? I would say there's a couple of points that has nothing to do with communication to a certain extent. So let's dive into this. Tony Robbins says it best. He says the quality of your life is solely determined by the quality of the questions that you ask yourself about life. Here's my more aggressive version to Tony's quote, which is, I dare everyone who's listening to this podcast to ask themselves one hard question about life every day for 30 days. Because if you do that, you'll never be the same ever again. Mm -hmm. So I call these 80-20 questions. If you ask yourself questions that force you to drive clarity, so what is the 20% of the questions that drive 80% of one's clarity in life, you start to optimize for your life. And obviously, the first point that we'll jump into the questions is realizing that the most important resource is time. We're all going to die mm -hmm. right? at some point. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I got terminally ill. We're all terminally ill. It's just we don't know how long it's going to be. Some of us have cancer right now. Unfortunately, we're going to might be passing away in the next three to five years. Other people, it's in 50 years, but we're all terminally ill. So understanding that creates an urgency to figure this shit out as quickly as possible. I just accumulated that urgency early because I, and then we'll jump to the questions, which is the reason I accumulate so quickly is I did something that I think most people my age don't do, which is I feel the pain of my mentors. What mm. does that mean? Let me give you an analogy. Don't you find it odd, Jason? that every successful rock band does the same like four or five things. They become successful. They get lost in drugs, women, alcohol. Then they break up and get depressed. And then they go to therapy and have a redemption concert. But you know what's fascinating about that loop? is it repeats over and over and over again with the new rock bands. Like nobody in the rock band goes, hey, what about what the Beatles did or what X did? Or <laughs> what, what, how about we not do that? Like nobody says that, nobody does that, which I think is so fascinating. Whereas what I think has separated me from most people my own age is I always begin my thought process rather by saying, what if Jason is actually trying to take care of me? What if he's actually trying to look out for me? What if when he talks about X or Y or Z or somebody, the guy talks about his divorce or some other, not you, but like, and then somebody else talks about, you know, a pain they had with a business partner. What if they're actually trying to have my good intention that hurts? Let me assume for a second that they're actually smarter than I am. So if we start with that piece first, then you start to feel the pain. Mm. And then when you feel the pain of their mistakes, you don't want to make them. I've never gotten drunk once in my life, never tried drugs. I haven't. I'm not against weed, but I've never smoked a joint in my life. Never. I still haven't even dated anyone yet, right? I'm still a virgin. I'll tell you that. I don't even share that on podcast. I'm still a virgin. And trust me, I have had multiple opportunities. But the reason I tell you all this stuff is to show you how cuckoo crazy I am about mitigating risk 
all of the mistakes. Same thing in business. I got super lucky. My business partner's 20 years older than me. So every mistake that our, our, our mutual kind of friend or in your case, friend in my case, just I love listening to him, Alex Hermosi, he made a shit ton of mistakes in his 20s. So I look at his businesses. I didn't make any of those mistakes. Why? Because my business partner's wiser than me and he helped me skip over all those things. Mm-hmm. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is assume your mentors are right and try and mitigate risks and look at their mistakes, not just their successes. So you can avoid all of the pitfalls and get straight to the win. I call this skipping the line. Last piece. I know I've been monologuing. Well, I'm kind of like, jump. do you want to jump in or do you want me to No, no, no. This is good. Keep on. <laughs> okay. Just <laughs> feel like I'm in a therapy session with these hilarious. So the, the other piece, the last piece is the 80-20 questions. So I won't go through all 30 questions unless you want me to, but I'll give you some easy Couple, ones yeah. to get us through. Right. So one is if I gave you all the money in the world, Jason, what would you do with your time? If I made you an instant billionaire, what would you do with your time? And the reason this question really messes up people is because all of us are biologically wired or not biologically, but just societally wired is a better word to optimize for a number we didn't put in our head, which is 65. Like, why are we all trying to retire at 65? Kobe Bryant died at 42. Steve Jobs had all the billions of dollars in the world. He had all the best doctors. He died in his 50s. Nobody could save him. So we're not trying to, we shouldn't optimize for 65. So a lot of times when I ask this question, Jason, I'll give you three, but let's start with the first one. Whenever I give them that question, they always answer travel. And I go, cool, Sherlock. So what are you going to do? Travel for three years and then die? And they go, no. So it messes people up. Reflect on that question. That's one. Number two is if you could only accomplish three things in your life and only three, what would you accomplish and why? This is what I call the focus question. So it forces you to focus on what actually matters. This is what Craig calls essentialism. Like what actually matters here at the end of the day? And finally, number three, well, there's a lot more questions. I've done this thousands of times over. But the third question, now I I got a brain fart. What is the third question? The third question is, oh yes, I got it. Is what's a dream or a goal? that you secretly gave up on and never told anyone about? Mm. That's the third question. So if you just do that every day, I've just done this with thousands and thousands and thousands of questions. And that's why I always like to say that I have the maturity of someone who's already dead. I I think that's brilliant. And if you're not already, those questions should be like a lead magnet for you, but whatever. They are still. Uh, I don't do life coaching, right? This is just uh, that's okay. Uh, (laughs) Today's show is brought to you by High Level CRM. High Level is an all-in-one platform designed to help entrepreneurs grow their businesses without the need for multiple softwares or an IT team. Not only does this does their easy-to-use software allow you to track and manage your leads throughout each phase of the relationship, but it also allows you to build funnels, track stats, and more. Guys, I sat down and added up the cost of software I was able to replace with just one app, and it was over $1,000 per month. Because this is an all-in-one application, I also save a ton of headaches connecting apps and building automations, and the team at Go High Level does a great job of getting you started quickly and easily when you sign on. I cannot more highly recommend these guys. Right now, Spear and Clover listeners get a free 14-day trial of high-level CRM for themselves. Click the link in our show notes to support the show and get started on your free 14-day trial today. I'm super excited that today's show is brought to you by the Global School of Entrepreneurship. Most practicing entrepreneurs cannot take two years away from their growing business to attend a full-time campus-based program or spend every weekend away from family and business for a couple of years. Finally, there's an accredited program specifically designed for you to work on and grow your business while completing your MBA. The GSE MBA complements the needs and schedules of someone actively engaged in an entrepreneurial venture while still covering the accredited curriculum expected from any MBA program. The Global School of Entrepreneurship offers a unique offering called the Mastermind to MBA program. It consists of 10 students who work together in a forum style cohort and meet every other week for a year. The GSE MBA helps you develop skills in critical thinking and strategic planning. Students also develop competencies in leadership, decision-making, and communication with both employees, as well as the important stakeholders in your business. You will be exposed to world-class academics and fascinating guest lecturers. You'll work on your business while working in your business. Students are guided by real-world entrepreneurs with decades of experience starting and scaling businesses just like yours. Best of all, I'm beyond proud to announce that the Global School of Entrepreneurship has agreed to offer one Spear and Clover listener a scholarship to join an upcoming mastermind to MBA cohort. 
They are looking for someone just like you to bring a unique perspective to the program, and they are accepting applications right now. To learn more and to apply, simply go to www.gse.mba/spear. That's www.gse.mba/spear. Don't miss this opportunity to level yourself up and surround yourself with other like-minded entrepreneurs just like you. Once again, to apply for the GSE MBA Spear and Clover Scholarship, simply visit www.gse.mba slash spear. That's www.gse.mba slash spear. Today's show is brought to you by Scaling with Media. I mean, literally, like if it weren't for the folks at Scaling with Media, you would not be getting this. Scaling with Media is a truly revolutionary company for any entrepreneur who wants to reach a larger audience without taking on the years of experience necessary to master the required skills. These guys do it all. From helping you develop your creative plan to editing, sourcing content, copywriting, ads management, and way more. Whether you're looking to launch a YouTube channel or podcast, or you just want to scale your business out to more eyeballs, these guys are the absolute best one-stop shop. But that's not all. Right now, Spear and Clover listeners who sign up for their brand launch package will receive a free, that's right, free professional grade studio kit that I'm actually recording right now on. The studio kit includes a professional microphone, stand, lighting, and headphones, and is worth well over $500. Take action now by going to scalingwithmedia.com forward slash Spear and claim your free studio kit. Again, that's scalingwithmedia.com forward slash Spear scalingwithmedia.com forward slash spear. Now back to the show. 10 years from now, you're going to look back at this time, maybe this conversation, maybe not. What are you going to say you were wrong about? What will have changed? I would say the biggest thing is two key areas that my my partner calls me out on, my business partner, spirituality and romantic relationships. Hmm. I always, always skip romance because I because I look at all the people I admire. There's a reason for that. As you can see, I'm super open about what my weaknesses is everyone I've admired in my life. Lewis Howes, Tony Robbins, you know, put anyone there. They all, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they all, you know where I'm going with this. They all, they all screwed it up. Yeah. All of them. I, I wouldn't up. go as far to say they all screwed it up, but they, it all definitely had a negative impact. Like I'm not going to say any more about that, in partic- like about specific people. But you're, I totally agree with you, and I'm sure that people at home can kind of draw their own conclusions there. Fair yeah. enough. But I, I'll speak for myself though. I yeah. honestly think a lot of them screwed it up, right? But the and and you could say negative. I'll say screwed up. But the point that I want to drive to a certain extent. You know, they fix it later. And the problem with relationships in general is even the ones that look successful, you don't actually know if they're successful Mm -hmm. because you don't know the people. So it's like the only person I could say right now in the world that I'm kind of confident in is like Tom Billy's relationship with his wife. But even that relationship isn't 100 percent because they don't have kids and I want kids. So anyways. As as the optimizer that I am, as you've seen, I'm very analytical. I said, okay, it's not that relationships are impossible. It's just out of the three buckets, wealth, health, and relationships, romantic specifically, that seems to be the hardest thing to optimize. So I've never focused on it. Same thing with spirituality. For me, my business partner loves the spiritual thing. But for me, it seems like a bunch of woo-woo. Like, it's just like, okay, like, it's cool. I have some of that, but I'm not that much of a yogi. So to answer your question, I think the two things I'll get wrong in my life in my 20s is not spending nearly as much time focusing on those two areas of life. It's a great answer. I also, by the way, when I was your age, was in the army, living in Germany and also Iraq zero romantic relationships. I worked on me and I worked on learning how to connect primarily with other men, but like with, with people connect with tribes. And, and I would, there was not a plan. Like, I love that you're structured and there's a plan there, but I share that. Like I was not out, you know, chasing anything. I was, I was just trying to like figure out who I was. I was reading a lot. I was talking to people. We, we would sit around in Iraq and ask these questions. You're asking those questions. I swear to you, People out there right now are listening to this that were there in those conversations, and we'd be sitting there, and they were a little more fun. It was always like, what would you do if you won the lottery? What would you do if you never had to work again? What would your superhero power be? And then like, you know, there's some other ones that probably I'm not going to repeat now, but like, but yeah, we, we would do that stuff all the time. And I, I think you're right. I think that gives you like, it's like play, right? It's like a trial of you know, well, what mountain do I want to climb? And, and, and then once you know what mountain you want to climb, you're like, you know, so somebody will say like, I want a Bentley and a big white house with marble floors. And I'm like, ugh, like, I don't want that. So then if I go make money, at least I know what I don't want. 
right? I think there's like levels to, to mastery. And one of them is like knowing what you don't want, identifying what sucks. And then like the next level is like, okay, this is what I do want. And then it's like, okay, this is the synthesis of like the different things that I like. And that's now my perspective and my point of view, right? Like a unique perspective, right? That's super interesting. I think it's clear too, that you're, you're so focused on your mission. Like, I think a lot of times you see people in rock bands or actors or entrepreneurs where they have a relationship. And the reason it's ruined is, well, they're not a fixed person. So what other person could they possibly be with if they're still cement that's not dry? Right. And so because of that, I think it's it's probably likely that when you do inevitably go, to, I'm hoping for you that when you do inevitably seek out relationships, it's at a time when the cement is a little more firm and you have time and, and stability to, to be there for each other and things like that. I, I would not doubt that at all. Um, but that's a really thoughtful answer that I appreciate you sharing with us. Hey, you're a thoughtful interviewer, man. That's why. Thanks, buddy. So you've done a bunch of interviews. You've helped a bunch of people. What is your favorite thing that you do professionally? Like, what is your favorite thing to do? Is it be interviewed? Is it work with clients, make videos? That's a great question. I love all of it, to be honest. But if I had to pick one, it would probably be interviews because it's just fun. Yeah. It's really fun. And I, and I feel like I feel like it's in my calling to to share information. I'll give you a kind of funny analogy here since we're on the topic. You know, every time I would listen to Lewis's podcast or Joe Rogan's podcast or anyone else's podcast, I would always ask myself like, shit, like I could do a better job if I was a guest, <laughs> right? Like that's always my thought, right? So that's why for me being a podcast guy, regardless of the show, is just really, really fun for me because I really get to showcase the value that I really have that I built years, you know, just building that foundation on top. And it's great to, to show that value new and newer people and keep kind of leveling up in the in the game of business and in life. What about you? What's your favorite thing? It's the, the same. So I get energy. The reason I do a podcast is when I was coaching entrepreneurs, I was having so much fun and I was, you can see their eyes light up. I do think it a lot, a lot like a stand-up comedy, comedy thing. Like if I see your eyes light up, that's a thing. I'm going to work on that. And if I see, if I say something, I think it's profound and you're like stone faced, then we move on, right? We drop from that, from the act. But one thing that I find interesting is I also, I, I grew up listening to talk radio and then it was audiobooks. And then in like 2009, I started watching uh, or listening to, to podcasts and I've never stopped. I sleep with headphones on. I've always loved being a part of these conversations. But one thing, just as you were talking, it reminded me of, and I've thought about this a little bit, but I think I'm going to think about it some more. Uh, and that is, I practice conversations before they're going to happen. And not in like a megaloma megalomaniac Kyle way or whatever, but like when I know I'm going to have a conversation, let's say when I was young, I know I'm going to be a little late. Okay. I know I'm going to be a little late for my curfew. What am I going to say if she, if she happens to see me there? I'm going to say this. And what if she says, but what about that? Well, then I'm going to say that, you know what I mean? In, in that case, that might've been dishonest, but I practice conversation. Do you find yourself practicing conversations before they happen? Yes and no. So, so yes, in the sense of, I guess my way of saying what you said is the question drill, right? Where we think about the questions that we think people will ask us and we preemptively guess them. So there's actually two or three questions you asked me. I couldn't have preemptively guessed. But the next time I get asked those questions, I'll have a cleaner answer, which is fine. But the other piece is I don't really practice them anymore. And I think the re unless it's hot, super, super high profile, unless it's like, okay, I need to nail this because this can make or break my career. Like this is the next step for me. Then I'll practice it in my mind. Like I might, for example, one, one exercise I teach people is make questions. I call it questions for celebrities. You have a notepad on your phone where you write questions to celebrities you haven't met yet. So basically when you meet them, you'll know exactly what to ask them because you might have 30 seconds with them. So this helps you condition your mind for the high profile, the, the, the Super Bowl kind of shots that you might get in your career at some point. That's that's how I do it. But I would say most of the time, because I just have so many conversations, it just becomes impossible because my whole life is conversations at this point. I call them my three C's, coaching, conversations, and content creation. That's pretty much all I do with 90% of my life. But on the topic, though, of conversations, let me jump in with something, which is more of a proactive tip around relationship building in general that I think is missed, Jason, is a lot of people ask me, and I'm sure they ask you, how do I get everyone to like me? How do I get people to like me? Whereas for me, the perspective is actually very different. Let's play this out a little bit. Let's say we meet somebody new every few days, Jason. Okay, every three to four days. And let's say that goes for a year. 
we'll meet give or take 100 people, right? And let's say we live for 50 more years. So let's assume in this conversation, me and you are both 30 and we live 50 more years until 80. So not to make this a math exam, so I'll keep it simple. 50 years times 100 people equals 5,000. So why do I share that? Because there's 7.8 billion people in the world. And in those 7.8 billion, we only get to meet 5,000 of them. So the question we should always ask ourselves when building relationships is who do we want those 5,000 people to be? And that really changes our mindset around who we talk to, who we engage with, where your mindset shifts from, how do I get this person to like me? To am I even talking to the right person? Am I even in the right room? What am I actually doing here? What am I trying to achieve? And it changes the level of thoughtfulness in our conversations. That's why the way I've networked has changed and has become a lot more strategic, which is simply this. I call this my value list. So I rank my relationships. I don't include family members in this. They just get a free pass because they're family. It's blood. You can't really change family. So what you do is you make a list of the top 10 people and you rank them in a very specific order. And the ranking system is based on generosity. So it's not based on their title. It's not based on, oh, I got this big yacht, or I don't give a shit about that in the same way you don't, right? It's really who's high integrity. So you'd be very high up on most people's value list. And that's a genuine compliment to you just based on the way you show up for other people, Thanks, man. right? Because the problem with relationships is most of us are pouring into people who aren't pouring back into us. And I think that's a big mistake. I think it's important to help other people. So a lot of people say, go the extra mile for people. I think that's nonsense. I think it's go the extra meter for everybody because most people aren't even doing that. Help them out a little bit, but run marathons for the people who really pour into you. That's the better nuanced conversation. So when you have a value list, what's great, especially with people like us, and I don't mean to put us on a pedestal or anything, we're just talking to a lot of people. It's really hard to manage all of these relationships. So every quarter, every month, every week, it's not, I'm not as good as, as I need to be, but I'll look at my value list and it'll tell me who my top 10 relationships are. And I'll re-rank that list. And now it's starting to become more like top 25, stuff like that. And those people I pour my life into, but there's a reason why because they'll introduce me to the best people in their network without me even asking them because they're the best people in my network and they're the most generous. And that's how I've been able to build my network strategically. So I probably have a Rolodex that someone who's 20 years older than me doesn't have because I've just been strategic about the way that I've added value and poured into the right people, which brings me to the principle. Being generous, my friends, is not enough. The key is to be generous to generous people. Because if you do that, my God, your Rolodex is just going to expedite really fast. We're lucky, I think. And it's because I really want to help you. And you sound like you really want to help me. What would you do if you didn't feel that way? How would somebody put this into play in an authentic way? Is it fake it till you make it? Is it, I mean, how would you do this? If, if I'm sitting here saying, look, I'm an engineer. I just want it. I have this technology. I have this thing. I just want to get it out to the world. I don't, if I'm sitting on the, if me or you, and I'll just speak for me, if I'm sitting on the couch and Brendan comes into my mind, I pick up my phone and I text Brendan right now. And I go, Hey man, it was great talking to you the other day. I want to introduce you to Mark England. He owns and lifted coaches. He spent 20 years working on language and you guys, this is true. You guys do different things, but you're both super connectors and total badasses. You guys got to connect. I'm going to do that. But what about the person who doesn't have that feeling? It's kind of like when my mom would get mad at me for spilling milk that I didn't realize I spilled. Like, what do you do if you just don't have those instincts? How can you develop that? Excellent question, Jason. So it's kind of like going to the gym, right? We got to learn how to walk before we run. So it's the same thing with this. Let me give a couple of nuanced answers to this. Because this is something that even the engineer, because I love that you brought up that example, right? The engineer who's like super introverted, like, oh, but how do I add value to people? Let me give you the one thing that any human being can do. Let's start there. You can still make that list. It just won't be 17 people. It might be three. And that's okay. It doesn't need to be 10. I know so many introverted engineers who have built great tech companies. Of course. Just yeah. off like two co-founders, at the, like Airbnb's founders, right? Like Brian and Joe, or Brian Cheskin and Joe Gebbia, they were both roommates in design school. And then Joe's buddy... There's a guy named Nathan who's like one of the best engineers in America. And he just like <laughs> built their back end and they fucking blew that shit up. So, yeah. and they successful. So you don't need a, a million people here. So the point that I want to drive is let's start with tactic number one. And you don't need to be a coach for this. You just need to have a listening ear. All you got to do is look at those three people. Even if it's one person, let's, let's make this worst possible scenario. One person, sit them down for 45 minutes and just ask them what their top three goals are for the year. And don't give them any advice. What are your top three goals for the year? Why are they important to you? What and then ask clarification questions. Nobody does that with each other. It's shocking. 
And that is the easy muscle. And then have them do that to you. If they're in their, your top three, then they, you should be in their top three too. That's kind of a, an ideal place. Like I'm not putting Alex Hermosi in the top of my value list because he doesn't care who I am for now anyways, right? So that's the key. Or Bill Gates, like pick the people that are in your circle. And that's one easy thing that anyone could do to add value. Okay. It doesn't require any PhD degrees. You just sit people down. What's your goal? Why is that important to you? And ask them clarifications, questions around their goals and don't give them advice. Just doing that will help give them a lot more clarity and value. That's one. The second thing that people could do, even if it's three people, is you message each of them individually. This is what I do with everyone in my top 10. That's the perk of being in my top 10 in the same way it is with yours. Is I ask them, I go, hey, is meeting new people beneficial for you? You could say no, but if it is, boy, do I have nine other amazing <laughs> people that you should talk to. So let's say out of my, for me, I'm very, being an extrovert is, 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 is mandatory for being in my top 10 because there's just so many people. So all of them want to meet each other. So that's the second value add I give. And you don't need to have a million people in your network is I introduce them all to each other. All my top 10 knows each other, right? So when somebody hits my top 10 or my top 25, I go, okay, this is my Rolodex. Who do you want to talk to? And they just have the introductions. I don't take any affiliate, but any business is made, whatever, just adds value to them. Like you, that's the second advice. The third advice is you don't dream big enough. So this is my tough love call out. What does that mean? A lot of people are going, oh, I don't have a network. I don't spend enough time. I'm a big fan of going, how big is your vision? How intentional are you? What The number one person on my value list currently is my business partner, Vamsi Polimetla. But people need to understand how I met that guy. Okay, I went to Columbus, Ohio, the middle of butt fuck nowhere. Nobody. Okay. Nobody goes there unless you're going there for Lewis. 5 a.m. workout. Steve Weatherford, a punter in the NFL who won multiple Super Bowl rings. I don't even know NFL. I'm just mentioning that for the sake of the conversation. He had an exercise, a workout that he was giving at Summit called the Deck of Pain. It was painful. Yeah. Let's put yeah, yeah. it that. <laughs> oh, you know, Oh, you know it. Cards? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, wow, Casey, you know it. It's true. You did cross. Of course you know it. Yeah, of course. So I didn't know that when I signed up for the deck of pain. But the question we got to ask ourselves is out of the 1,500 people who go to summit, let's say, who's going to sign up for the deck of pain? 30 people, 50 people. So I was one of those people and Vamsi was too. That's how I met him. And then after I met him and I realized this brown guy was actually really successful in the coaching business, I latched onto him like a virus. Said, so what's the next conference you're going to? Let me buy your hotel. I didn't have any money back then because I wanted that intentional proximity with that guy. So it's also about saying and having that tough love conversation around, okay, you're introverted, you're shy, cool. But what do you want to do in life? What's your actual big passion? And what relationships do you need to actually make that successful? And I would encourage people, you don't need to spend a million dollars here. I call this the 10% rule. 10% of your income I don't care if you're making $10,000 a year or a million, should go into your personal growth, at least 10%. At least. So I spent money I didn't have to spend 300 bucks to go to Summit. And I met my business partner and I've met ridiculous amounts of money and impact. And that's what we need to do. So where's the engineering conference? Go to it and put yourself out there. Brilliant. To that point, where does, like, but I'm afraid, where does stage fright come from and how do you get over it? This right. is the question you've definitely been asked a million times. Of course, brother. So there's two parts to that. One part is saying you actually don't need to worry about stage fright, which is the valueless strategy. You could do that in your closet. Okay. Because these are people yeah, you already yeah. know, right. right? So like the people, like all of the, the times when I get virtual coffees at this point, if you do it often enough, it's only going to be from introductions at some point. That's why to get to Bill Gates, you need an introduction. Because so many people want his time that he pretty much just relies on his inner circle to give him introductions. That's how it works, as you go, as you know, but I'm telling the audience more, as you go up the food chain, so to speak. So what that's one piece. Start with the value list. Don't worry about stage fright. Just meet friends of friends, you'll get along, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. The other piece though is stage fright in general. Where does it come from? So I'll argue that stage fright has nothing to do with us, but the education system. Think about it. Where do we learn how to speak formally? School, elementary school, high school. But all of those presentations, Jason, have three main problems. Number one, they're all mandatory. We don't wake up one morning and say, hey, Jason, you want to like get breakfast and present all day? Nobody's saying that, right? So that's one. Number two is all of those presentations are different. So it's never, what are you passionate about? What do you love? What do you want to talk about? Engineering, you know, a CrossFit, a fitness. No, you got to talk about Shakespeare and poetry. And then after you're done that, you got to talk about the history of Missouri. And you're like, do I? I don't live in Missouri. <laughs> I don't. I don't live there. I don't know why they're forced. 
right? So that's number two. And I'm not even done yet. The worst thing is number three. Every presentation, I don't know who invented this shit. Every presentation is tied to a punishment. 12-year-old kids, 13-year-old kids. By the way, Billy, if you don't do a great job in this history presentation, that will literally impact zero area of your life. Not only will you not get a pat on the back, but you'll get a slap in the face and you'll lose 20% of your grades in the process. Wow, isn't that fun? So our whole life, 100% of everything that we've done in our life, Jason, unless you're like a theater kid, all your presentations are mandatory. All your presentations are different and you have so many of them to go through. Mm -hmm. And they're all punishable, which leads to the following conclusion. We grow up believing that communication is a chore so it becomes one. Mm. In other words, nobody wants to get better at doing the dishes. That's why a lot of us see communication as a bad thing because all of the memories we have as a kid is negative versus guys in sports. The reason we grew up loving sports, most of us, is not necessarily because of the sport itself, in my opinion. If you grew up in India, you probably would have loved cricket. I think it's more about the childhood memories that you have of sports that are all positive, but they're all negative with communication. That's fascinating. I have a theory that I think of somebody getting stage fright. Nobody's ever gotten stage fright from yelling fire when there's a fire in the back of the theater. Why? Because the message is true and it's really important to everybody in the room and it's urgent. Right. And so it's one of those things where it, it's kind of the inverse of what you just said. And so, like, if you're going to get up in front of people and speak, think about it. Is is this a fire that I need to alert everybody in this room about? And if it's not and it's only important to maybe five people out of the audience, we'll just meet with those five people and save yourself the time and the, the stress. Right. But to me, I just think of like, is this message really important, really urgent? And is it for everybody that I'm talking to? And if I can answer that, yes, I feel like I can stand up with my shirt off and beat my chest. But if it's not, then I don't want anything to do with it. I've told myself this lie up until pretty recently that like my message is for each of you, but it's not for all of you. And then I started having a podcast and I was like, well, maybe not. Like, you know, maybe that was just me not wanting to talk to people, but I love the way you put that. And I think the way I've looked at it is just kind of the inverse of that. Right. And I love that. And I know we talked about that last time. I, oh, I'm we? still yeah. shocked. I'm still shocked that you don't speak professionally. It blows my freaking mind. But the, the other piece, and we got we got to push you to do that. But I think the, the other piece of that is the fourth point that I'll add, the frame of reference. Because theater kids, same age, same education system, they don't have really that many problems with communication. And a lot of them are introverts too. So why do they communicate well? Because their frame of reference is different around communication. Mm -hmm. Most kids growing up, they see communication as a chore. Oh my God, school presentation, I got to talk fucking Egypt, and then I got to talk about the history of Missouri. This sucks. Whereas the theater kid goes, I get to show an experience. My parents are coming. I get to create this play and share these ideas. So even if they're nervous, the frame is completely different. So what's the punchline? If we change your frame, we'll change your mindset around communication. That's why I love the question, how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? Because the, what that question attempts to do, and I'm sure I'll build on that as I progress and I mature over my career, but that's the, the beginning part of my thought leadership is when you start thinking of that question, most of us, first of all, haven't thought of it. And the second piece is you start to reframe your mind around communication from seeing it as a chore to going, huh, you know what? If I actually went and speak professionally instead of doing this podcast, which is great, maybe I can start a movement around yeah. Spear and Clover. Maybe I can speak in front of 10,000 people. Maybe my platform will be so big that Tim Ferriss – We'll go, hey, Jason, I've seen what you've been doing, man. I loved what you, I loved your speech the other day, that event we were speaking at together. Can I be on your podcast? And then he'll ask you. And it's those possibilities that we start to dream about and we think bigger and bigger and bigger enough until we get excited about actually pursuing it. Yeah, it's have to versus get to. That's like like everything you just said, have to versus get to. You know, like they have to give this speech that they don't want to. They get to give this experience. I just think like I think of that a lot when I've helped people in the past with stuff like sales and stuff. I could talk to you all day and I, I hope to talk to you more off this because I, I think we should be friends. Yes, uh, but, 100%. But, but Brendan, there's two questions that I have every guest that comes on the show and I'm going to ask you those questions now. Are you ready? Let's do it, man. All right. The first question is, if you had access to unlimited financial resources, how would you profitably grow your current businesses? Absolutely. I would say the biggest bottleneck in my business right now is lead gen. It's top of funnel. 
because a lot of people still don't know who I am. So I would say if I had unlimited resources, I would, and this is something I've been I've been hesitant on. I haven't written that big check yet because I've done it for YouTube. I wrote the check for YouTube, but I haven't wrote it for TikTok, Instagram. I know I could crush on those platforms, but it's just my insecurity around dropping the, the, the change to make that happen. So if I had unlimited resources, I would go guns blazing, Gary Vee style, hire like five people and just build a ridiculous personal brand in like six months. That's what I would do. Great. And you're ready for it. I think I think part of it too is like you have to be undeniable before you can become undeniable. You know, like uh, you know what I mean. Like that's because is that an a, original. Yeah, that was just now. I, I have a friend, Kenny Kane. He has a small group. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. He has a small group of like hyper performers from the LA and Hollywood area that are in a, a group he calls Treehouse. And it's this unbelievable thing that's easy for him because he spent 35 years becoming the guy who can just answer that question, right? Just just interesting. The second question is if you had to give up everything that you've been doing now, so you cannot no, you can no longer teach people how to be communicators. I know it's a bummer. If you had to give up everything you've done up until now and start something totally new that you've never done before professionally, what do you think that might be? So, so you mean like, I can't coach anything. So I can't do life coaching. It could literally, I have to switch industries. It would be, yeah, I would prefer if it just make it more interesting. Yeah. yeah cause, cause it wouldn't be interesting. You're right. Cause I'll be in this industry for the rest of my life. I love yeah. it so much. I'll, I'll die in this industry, but I would say if I had to change my mind, two, two thoughts come to mind, which aren't super interesting. The first one is I might just go back to my nine to five, like, cause I'm a very different type of entrepreneur. I'm not the kind of guy who wanted to be one. I kind of became one by accident. You know, I've always believed there's two types of entrepreneurs, born and made ones. I agree. So, right. So I'm not a born entrepreneur. I don't consider myself to be one, like a Gary Vee who's like a selling lemonade and all that stuff. I'm, I might just go back to my corporate job. That's one thought. The other thought I had was if I had to change industries, probably being a stand up comedian is something I've, I kind of wanted to try. But like, I'm funny, but I'm not Andrew Schultz funny. But if I had to, if I had to switch industry, I might give that a shot. Yeah, but you know better because I think if you look behind the curtain, you'd realize like you're not funny as him in the moment. But what if you did it every night, three sets a night for you know five years, ten years, something like that? By the way, shout out to Andrew Schultz, I'm a huge fan. But uh, but I, I think you definitely could kill it. I felt that way as well, and I just realized that I wouldn't like the lifestyle, and so I just look at okay, what do I respect about that profession, and how can we like incorporate it here? I've really been thinking about that a lot lately. I mean, I'll tell you a story of that because you mentioned yeah. it. But I, by the way, I love how we literally think of the same way. Yeah. And, and this is a principle for everyone listening. There's some part about relationship building, guys, that we need to get over with, which is you could have everything in common and not like each other. And then there's other times you meet somebody and you're just like, I feel like I've known you. Like, I feel like I, I've talked to you before, right? And that's really the key is you can't make that shit up. So you just got to talk to a lot of people until you land on a Jason. And then when you meet on a Jason, you kind of just cling on to him and go like, hey, we should be like best friends. Yeah. And that's really the, the game. The story I wanted to tell you, though, was when I was 12, before I made the decision to be an accountant, funny enough, I actually wanted to be a static comedian. And Russell Peters is like my hero. And the reason I, I decided to not do that was an episode of MTV Cribs. So for those of you listening to this, MTV Cribs is like this old show of like people who kind of like before like a, the Kim Kardashians of the world where a celebrity would walk you through their house. And Russell Peters was one of the episodes. So I watched it with excitement. The guy's like my hero. Oh, this used to be. And there's one scene in the in the show that like traumatized me where he got into his bedroom. He opened up his drawers and all of it was porn tapes. All of it. And then he got divorced after a year of being married like twice or something. And I said, you know what? Maybe I don't want to be Russell Peters. And that's what dissuaded me from doing that. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Russell Peters is the most famous comedian in the world who Americans have never heard of. Correct. He traveled, he's got an enormous fan base. He's hilarious. I think he's bigger now because he's been on Rogan. He's done some other stuff locally. And he's certainly a, a huge name, but like a lot of people, unless you're a big stand up fan, don't know who he is. And meanwhile, he's, I think he's been, I think he's done the biggest audiences in stand up history. Like he's done like 500,000 person shows. Like it's insane. Brendan, you're a bad dude, man. I love, I love this conversation. I love what you're doing. I think you're incredibly skilled. I think you're authentic. I think our listeners will agree. How can they find you? Likewise, brother. I just want to acknowledge you as well. This is one of the best conversations I've ever had. And I mean that genuinely. So take it as a compliment for me because obviously, yeah. you know, I do a lot of them. So thanks, man, for your openness and, yeah. and just your, I love your beginner's mindset. Yeah. You know, you're always willing to be a beginner. I think that's why you've been so successful and you'll continue to be. So I appreciate it, bro. Thanks, brother. How can people First, find you? 
First one. So two ways to keep in touch. One, YouTube channel. Just go to Master Talk in one word. You'll have access to hundreds of free videos and I'd communicate ideas. Number two, I do a free workshop over Zoom. It's a free workshop. It's live. It's not interactive. And it's about, sorry, it is interactive. And it's about communication. So if you want to jump in on that, all you have to do is register at rockstarcommunicator.com. Awesome. Brandon, thank you so much. Thanks, bro. Thank you guys so much for watching or listening to the show. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to show us some love by liking, rating, and subscribing so we can keep making more and better content. If you'd like to support the show and get a great additional content like exclusive shows and even live group masterminds, please head over to patreon.com slash spear and clover to become a member of the tribe. If you're interested in learning more about how we help entrepreneurs, visit spearandclover.com or message us on any of our platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.